afternoon. Welcome to this session, uh, the new session of the afternoon. As is, Ross has said this morning, one of uh, the improvement in the fight against doping has been the introduction of out of competition tests. I think there are at least two other major advances. The first one was the introduction of blood as a matrix which could be used for the detection of doping substances. <coughs> and the second one is so it was in 2004. And the second one has been in 2010, the shift from the, the detection of a prohibited substance or a metal in, a, in the body of the athlete, shift from there to the detection of the effects of the prohibited drug or metal on the body and use this evidence as a proof of doping. So I have now the pleasure to introduce one of the experts who is asked to evaluate blood profiles of athletes for different sports is Professor Olaf Schumacher. He's an expert of blood doping. He works in Aspetar in Doha and is for Thank, th thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. No, no, leave it. Leave it. Yeah. Th thanks, Mario, for the for, for the kind introduction. And welcome to this to this afternoon session. And as you have heard from the speakers this morning, um, even the ones that are not directly involved in cycling, I was surprised that in both of the opening statements, actually doping was the first thing that they, they talked about. And it's a bit of a shame of, uh, uh, for cycling because cycling obviously is much more than doping. But um, to be honest, I had a quite a similar experience. More than, than 10, 15 years ago, I started as a team physician for the, for the German national team in cycling. I've been doing that for 10 years. I stopped a couple of years ago. Um, and obviously, being the young doctor, I was sent to the mountain bike races. So I went to some kind of a European championship of mountain biking or World Cup. I can't really remember. So eventually, we had one of our riders winning. So I was standing in the feed zone all proud that my rider had won and there's this a colleague of a nation that, that I won't mention came to me and said, hey great, how did you prepare your rider? And I said, well, I was telling him we did this training and they did high intensity interval training and all these things, but he didn't really understand. For him, preparation was medical preparation. And at that stage in the conversation, this is how I realized how important that actually was in the cycling world at that time. But obviously, hopefully, um, I'm going to show you or we're going to discuss a little bit later. This has changed nowadays. And uh, it's my, my task today to give you a bit of an, of an, uh, of an overview of on, on the Athletes Biological Passport, this, this initiative that has, has come up in 2008 and where cycling has, has been a bit, bit of a groundbreaker in with, with this regard. So we could talk a little bit about the past, the present, and the future. And more precisely, I'm going to give you some background for those Folks of you who have never heard about it, I know there's specialists in, in the area about it, but there, I know there's, there's people who have no idea how it works. I'm going to try to be a bit more, more detailed about it. Also, with regards to some, some recent cases where you probably want to know how it actually works, and if I, if I read the forums on internet and the forum discussions on internet on the biological passport cases, there's a considerable lack of knowledge out there when it comes to the procedures. Uh, then we're going to discuss a little bit if, if, if it actually works, does, does it have an impact? And maybe have a little look into the future, how do we use it and what can we do in the future to even improve our use of the passport. So um, let's, let's start a little bit with the background and of course there's no anti-doping talk without Lance Armstrong. You know? And Lance Armstrong, obviously we all know he's the past, but he basically illustrates the dilemma that anti-doping was in for a long time. You all know this famous tweet where he said he was tested <coughs> 500 times and he never tested positive that is proof um, that he, ne he didn't do. Obviously, we're all a little bit Lance Armstrong. Now, you're shocked a bit, but um, I'm going to show you why. This is why. You know, this is the city I'm working in, Doha. This is my way to work. And you see on the left side, there are these speed cameras. You know, and obviously, you know, I drive past them every day. Every day I drive too fast, but I never get caught because I know where they are and I slow down. Right? And that's a little bit the same. Than, than in the passport, you know. So, so in the conventional doping tests, we are like speed cameras. You know, when they come post competition, you know, and you know, okay, I'm going to be clean for post competition. All is going to be good. I'm never going to test positive. Now, in traffic, there have been people who have been very smart, very smart in traffic, um, and those are the Italians. 
he would tell me, okay, the Italians were also very smart though because they were the first to use the EPO, as many of you might know. But they've introduced a system called Tutor. So Tutor is a system on the highway where you go through a gate with your car and then a couple of k's later you go through another gate and they ca somehow calculate the average that you're, you're driving between these two gates. And if the average is, is more than a certain, certain allowance, then you get a ticket. If not, you're good. And also this is a little bit what we're doing now um, uh, with the passport. So we, we, we're shifting away from the traditional approach of spot testing athletes with urine samples at given times more towards kind of a longitudinal monitoring of certain biomarkers that are influenced by different doping techniques. Uh, so, so, so the rider is not sure anymore that if at a certain time he has no do doping substance in the system that he's not caught because the effects that the doping substance might have on certain markers might last li much longer. So the, the passport is in fact an electronic record of all kind of, of uh, test results that are taken from an athlete, um, they are evaluated regarding the athlete himself, individual reference ranges. I'm going to come to that and try to explain that to you in a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. And by deviating from these individual reference ranges, likelihoods for doping are determined. Now, um, let, let's talk a bit about these individual reference ranges. Of course, reference ranges, if you go to a lab, if you get your blood tested or whatever tested, or even your height or your weight, um, you have reference ranges of what is normal for you or for your age group or for your gender or whatever. And that is determined based on a sample collective of other people of your age of your gender. So for example, if you take this room and we look at the weight, you know, our average weight, if it's the males, <coughs> will be around 75 kilos. There's a couple of us who are going to be much lighter, and there's a couple of us who are going to be much heavier. Now, if, if that's the normal range, and you say, of course, I'm going to be in the normal range, no doubt. But if, if myself, I'm maybe like 80 kilos, if I put on maybe 10 kilos, for me, I would be way overweight, so out of my individual <coughs> range, but I would still be in the normal range of the population, where 95% of that distribution will be in. This is why there's something called individual variation. So my weight will also vary, but we're within a much smaller range than the weight of my peer group, obviously. If I eat a little bit more, I'll be a little bit more on the high side. So at Christmas, I might be here. If I did eat a little bit less during summer to get like a, a good body for the beach, I'll be a little bit on the low side. So this is the intra-individual variation opposed to the inter-individual variation between us. And now, the passport does exactly this. It tries to quantify these variations. Um, and obviously, it, it's not as simple. It gets a bit more complex, because the natural variation, this is what this represents, these two types of variations, is obviously composed, again, of biological variation, the variation that's caused by nature, but also the variation that is caused by my measurement system. So the scale where I, where, I, where I put my weight or where, where I determine my weight by might show uh, one kilo <coughs> more or less one day or another. Mine always shows two, two kilos too much, so it seems to be a, a systematic error in that one. But um, anyway, so this is what the same thing we're dealing with in, in blood variables. Now, the biological variation is influenced by many factors, and some of them are, are, are pictured here. The biggest effector of um, <coughs> of biological variation on certain blood markers is possibly exercise mainly due to its effect on plasma volume which dilutes or concentrates certain variables in the blood. Obviously there's are many other factors. You'll have different values in the blood depending whether it's summer or winter. Um, in the morning you might have some, some values that are different and then in the evening um, some people have higher values than others. That's the predisposition. All these things but they can somehow be quantified. Um, on the other hand, um, and, uh, basically, and this is what the, basically the, the athlete's biological passport does in a mathematical way. It quantifies these variations, the influence of these factors through a mathematical model. I'm not going to go into details with this because this is way beyond my expertise. Now we've got the, basically the biological variation somehow covered. Huh? And the analytical variation 
is aimed to be or is aimed to be kept really small and this is why there's really strict laboratory uh, procedures. This is why you can't just go to a lab, take a blood sample and introduce that into the passport. You have to have certain analytical and pre-analytical procedures to make this happen. And these are only respected in water labs. This is a pretty strict uh, process. Now, um, once the passport now calculates um, the individual variation, the natural variation of an individual based on all these factors um, and determines that a certain variable is beyond that variation, then that passport is flagged, right? And it goes to an expert panel composed of <coughs> one, two or three individuals. Usually one individual looks at it first with an expertise in, the, in this area and that, that expert determines uh, the likelihood for this uh, this value or this pattern that you see of being normal variation, a pathology, or blood manipulation of doping. Now, this is where it gets tricky. So it determines the likelihood for each of those. Um, they are not dependent. I think that's really important, right? You cannot say that, okay, it doesn't look like normal variation, it doesn't look like a pathology, so it must be doping. Right? So this is important to understand, I think, in the passport procedure. It doesn't work by exclusion. You can have a, a, a certain abnormal pattern that you see, which is really abnormal, but which is not a pathology, but what you think is not typical for doping. Right? So, so the likelihood for doping in that case is small because it's not typical. The likelihood for pathology is really, really low, and the likelihood for it to be normal is also really low. Huh? So what do you do? You don't really know in that case. And in any case, when something is abnormal and an expert has flagged the, the, the passport as abnormal and likely for doping, <coughs> he gives a recommendation to the Federation, usually after a backup evaluation of two more experts. <coughs> So this is kind of a backup security system that not one expert can just, just say, okay, this is, this is suspicious for doping. This is, we go, it, the, guy, the, the rider gets convicted and off he goes. So they give a recommendation to the, to the Federation regarding the likelihoods. So they don't say the rider is guilty of doping. They just say the likelihood of the profile being typical for doping is high. Hmm? Once that's done, the rider gets contacted and gets asked for explanation. So the Federation sends them a letter and says, listen, your passport shows these abnormalities. What do you say about it? And the rider might say, yes, this reason my grandmother was sick and I was <coughs> at altitude and I took this medication and this is why my, why my blood passport looks like this. He then goes back to the Federation with that. The Federation sends it to the expert. The expert evaluate the evidence, compare it with the fast passport and say whether this is plausible or not, the explanations match the profile or not. And if they don't, then usually a procedure is opened against the athlete based on, adver on an adverse passport finding. This shows you that there's kind of a layer, with a system with multiple layers of security. It's just not a software flagging, a, flagging a, an abnormality. Now, um, does it work, this system? What do you think? Any ideas? I see some people from the proto teams here, you know, so from Katusha Lotto, you know, BMC, so I will ask Team Sky is here. So any opinions from 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 the from, from the audience? Oh yes, Marco, thanks. You know, I think it it works uh, like uh, in a way that <coughs> give you a strong signal that uh, you are un more uh, more often under the radar so uh, but then uh, practically when you see the, um, the the cases that have been put in forward there's a you know the, the, the main complaint that you get is that it's too late and then uh, you know you 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 get another is under uh, investigation after two or three years you know he committed the the, the cheating so it's a uh, it works a lot because it changes a lot the behavior of the runner. So it, it works, but it has to to be improved. That's the opinion of, as of an athlete. Mm -hmm. Good. Other opinions? Yes. Lotto is, is giving us some input here. Hi, I'm Jan Mathieu from Lotto. I believe it really. I think it's a good system. 
But I agree with you that if you have to wait two years before you have the results, uh, with Ryan Bajan Ryan, who has already stopped his career, mm -hmm. and now with the new case too, if they go to another team, you pay a rider who did something stupid, I think, in another team. So that's a bit difficult. But I understand you have to see a, a profile, perhaps. Uh, uh, but now I heard that it was eight months after he gave his uh, his. Uh, is the answer to the committee, and they, they wait eight months to, to answer him. I find that uh, it was a, a long time. That's my remark. But uh, I believe that I find it very good, and I think that, that the teams like, like our team become a bad results with that. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So I think th those are two important points that we, we get basically from the field that the belief is there that from a, from a purely, let's say, a scientific point or from an application point of view, it seems to work, but from an administrative point, there's still a large margin of improvement, if I can probably put it like this. Um, from, from the numbers, what would you think? You know, how many of the people that actually are doping do we get with the passport? I've written some numbers here, so if I can, do you think we catch everybody? Do you, who hands up who thinks that everybody's caught with the passport, everybody's doping? Oh, not very optimistic here, I'm afraid. You know, so let's go to the other, other hand, uh, other end. 25%. Who thinks that we catch 25%? Yes. All right. So that's about 25% of the audience. Yes. 50%. Ah, oh, of course. Tendency of the middle. That's, that's the same. Okay. <laughs> I got some numbers for you. You know, so so let's 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 a little bit first look 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 at the science behind it. And obviously, there's a couple of scientific articles um, uh, on, on the topic, you know, where they've, they've studied it in a, in a very detailed manner. And bad news first, bad news first. Um, there's been a study by my friend and colleague, Mike Ashenden, who looked at microdosing of EPO, you know. And um, long story short, the athletes that were microdosed did not, were not flagged by the passport in this study, despite the fact that they increased their red cell mass, which is the total amount of hemoglobin that carries the oxygen in your blood, quite significantly, but none of them showed any significant changes in hemoglobin and reticulocytes. Now, there are some shortcomings in the study, and the main shortcoming is that they only used the passport during the time when they actually used the EPO. They didn't use the passport <coughs> during the time where they stopped using the EPO, and this is usually when we see the most important changes in the blood. So this probably with all the respect for the study, this is probably one of the reasons why they didn't pick up anybody, you know. So, but we have to face it that we probably have a, a problem with microdosing. Okay. Next study um, is transfusions. Um, blood transfusions, big topic, as you know, you know, they have, uh, another group has looked at it and different types of passport have been applied, you know, I'm not going to go into detail and the sensitivity of the of the passports or the, the, the ability to catch the true dopers or to identify the true negatives is here, depending on the approach, somewhere 40, 50 percent, so half of it. <coughs> again, this study, again, only used the passport during a certain phase of the doping regime because for transfusion, obviously, you know you have to withdraw the blood and then put it back in again in both obviously both actions will trigger very distinct patterns in your blood. And they have only looked at one phase and not at the other. So they've only looked at the phase when they reinfused the blood, but not at the phase where they withdrew it. Obviously that would also trigger reaction. So a little bit the same shortcoming than the first study. And um, then the next study that, that I'm, that I'm going to show is not only not because it's one that we did, but, um, but I think it's, it's one that basically kind of covers these shortcomings. Um, um, what my, my co-worker Torben Potgies did at the time, together with the Lausanne Anti-Doping Lab, we kind of did a simulated uh, cycling season with students who were not involved in cycling. You know, they were just, just volunteers. And um, we had two parts of the study, a principal investigator, which was my, my colleague Torben, who <coughs> applied kind of a doping regime with transfusions or with the ethics committee and everything involved, so don't worry. And then the doping control investigator was sitting at the uh, uh, Lausanne anti-doping lab who was allowed to order 10 tests over, uh, uh, over a year and try to identify the, uh, the individuals that Torben had tried to blood dope for certain races. Obviously they didn't race, but that was just uh, a, a fake. And the investigator, he just knew the results of, his blood, of the blood test that he ordered and he knew which races the riders, which were not riders, were targeting. And these are the results. And 
I, busy slide, but I just uh, direct your, uh, your attention to this uh, number here and sensitivity that of all the athletes that were doped, we were able to identify 72% which is not bad, which is not bad, but it all depends on the targeting, on the ability to test the mom at the right moment. Uh, so that's, I think that's the key message from all the studies that have been done on the passport. <coughs> the power is quite high, even detecting, let's say, relatively minor intervention, because this was one blood bag, so it's not a lot, you know, so the, 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 uh, the, the doping intervention. But still, with good target, test, target mm. testing, the, a good investigator with a bit of knowledge was able to, invest, to, to identify more than 70% of the ones. Now, in the field, just get to give you some, some data in the field, I'm mean, going to come to the point mentioned by Marco just in a second, to give you a little bit the size of the program. In 2013, um, <coughs> all over sports, these are WADA numbers just released now, about 17,000 past sport tests have been done on 6,000 athletes and 35 anti-doping organizations have implemented the passport. So cycling has started in 2008 and <coughs> since then many other federations have basically jumped on board. And since then 55 athletes were convicted on passport data only. So it's actually quite successful given the fact that it has not been there for long. There's a question up there, yes? Uh, when you say convicted, you're talking about, uh, it, se it seems like you're talking no, they have been banned. That's no, no, the wrong no, word. Right. Excuse my English. You know, no, they have been banned. Banned based on the fact that it's highly likely that they yes. were doping, but it's not conclusive evidence that they were doping. Or do you take it as conclusive? Evidence? The, the 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 panel took it as conclusive evidence, and the level of of of, of evidence they're asking for in a legal panel is comfortable satisfaction. Okay. Huh? So, and not only 55 athletes have been banned, but also based on the passport more than 300 athletes have been found positive for EPO. So by looking at the passport, I'm going to show you some examples in a minute, they were able to identify suspicious athletes, go in there with conventional tests and get them tested with, with normal doping tests and then have them positive with EPO, which is also a good thing. Now, um, just to get something straight, because um, I read in the forums a little bit on the passport, there are not enough tests done on the riders. If you calculate the statistics and all these things, every rider only has three tests or four a year. You can't make a profile with this. This is data from the UCI from 2010 and indicates the number of tests every uh, a certain number of riders have within the professional peloton. So in 2010, and you will imagine that four years later, this will have considerably evolved. So after two years of testing, um, more than 100 riders had 10 tests, but also more than 100 riders had 20 to 25 tests in their profile, which is quite significant. And nowadays, and Mario, correct me if I'm wrong, we have riders that have close to 100 tests, and not few. You know, obviously not everybody, but the the suspicions were suspicious ones, obviously. So that is is quite a quite a quite a quite a signal, I think, and gives indication on on how much effort is actually put into this, and shows how narrow the gap in the door is actually for riders to sneak through. Still they do, but it's quite quite difficult. We also have, have information on how it works as a deterrent, and this is what, what, what Marco just pointed out of you. you. Some of you might have already seen this, this, this figure, but it has been updated since, and I'm grateful and indebted to Mario who gave me the information. You see um, the number of abnormal red, young red blood cells in cyclists, right? So they're, they're abnormal if they're either high, those are the green bars, or, or if they're really low, those are the blue bars, right? So in 2000 and 2001, there were a lot of very high young red blood cell values. This is probably due to the use of EPO, who will stimulate these young red blood cells to come out of the bone marrow. Now that has completely changed in 2003. There were a lot of very low values with no more young red blood cells. This is easily explainable by the fact that here, in 2002, the EPO urine test was introduced. So the riders, they knew, oh shit, I'm going to be tested in urine. If I only still take the substance, I'm going to be positive, so I'm going to stop taking the substance. This will cause the retics to fall. So when I'm at the race and I'm tested, you know, my retics will be really low, but my urine will be clean. So I'm, I'm good. 
So still the overall number of abnormalities was still around 12% in all the samples. So not much had changed, just the way of, of using a certain substance had changed. But then in 2008, and as you, as you know in 2008 the passport was introduced, there was a dramatic drop of the abnormal values to something be between 2 and 4%. And 2 and 4% is not a lot. This is probably what you would roughly expect in the normal population as well, with low or high values. And you see that low values are, close, are progressively disappearing. You know? So um, that's actually quite a good sign. Mm -hmm. So the data from the field actually shows that it does work. Maybe it's mainly a deterrent effect at that stage, but that's also an effect. So it's not about only catching the dopers, but maybe preventing them from doing so is also a good thing. So how do we use it best, the passport? That's not only as a, as a um, of course, we can use it as a, uh, as a sanctioning tool when you have grossly abnormal values like here in hemoglobin or here in reticulocytes. <coughs> you can go to court and most of the panels will believe you that this is not normal. This is very likely caused by doping. You can also use it, if you see it over a certain time, several times, to tell the court or the panel, listen, this rider has cheated at least twice, with, uh, between one and two years, and this will maybe give the court the opportunity to ban the rider a little bit longer because of multiple use of the substance. This is an aggravating circumstance. We just had the case with the International Track and Field uh, uh, Federation where an athlete was, was banned approximately three years because they were able to demonstrate that the athlete doped twice or three times. Also, um, we can use it as a target testing tool. As I just mentioned, by using appropriate urine testing to, to, to better catch the athlete with conventional testing, which will make, obviously, the process and the procedure much easier. So you can also then identify athletes at risk. You know, if you see very variable profiles, you can identify these, these, these athletes, put them into groups, identify these groups, and go with target testing schemes around these groups to, uh, to, to catch them. And this is obviously in times of shortage of resources and money always a, 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 an opportunity. Um, now we can also, based on the data that we get with the passport, estimate the doping prevalence. And that means, prevalence means how many dopers do we have in our population. So we can do that if we look at the distribution of certain values in our population that we have compared with a population that is not doped <coughs> and a population that is doped at 100%. So um, this is the distribution. It's a bit complicated. The ABPS is kind of a, uh, kind of a score that is taken in the, uh, in the passport and you have a reference group that is doped and the, the distribution will some be something like this and the distribution of an undoped group will be somewhere here and then usually your athlete will fall somewhere in between here and you can thereby determine how many dopers you are expecting in your collective. That makes the testing a little bit easier because you can then separate by country or by team or something and then direct your resources to the ones that have been identified as suspicious. Now, um, where from here? This is what, what we can do now. Not, not everything is implemented but it's getting there. Um, from here, I think the, the first thing that we have to mention that the passport has worked quite well for the detection of blood doping, but there's new models being implemented for the detection of steroid doping and for the detection of the abuse of growth hormone. Those are new models. The steroid uh, module is operational since last year. The, the growth hormone endocrinological model is coming in the near future. So blood doping has a little bit paved the way for the, for the other means of, of, of of uh, doping detection, which are much more relevant in other sports than cycling. You will agree that blood doping is not really relevant in, in, in track and field sprint, um, but uh, steroid doping is. Mm. So we're moving into other directions. We're aiming at um, using new markers, and Janis is going to talk about that in, in, in just a few minutes. So we're, I think the passport needs to move away from the very simple markers that we have more into an integrated um, strategy of using <coughs> probably proteomics or metabolomics, I don't believe in genetics, um, so into that direction. We might use markers from the iron metabolism. Um, we might use marks of performance. There's a lot of, lot of discussion about that. And um, we might use information from the police, from FBI, from CIA and all these things and or integrate all that into a network to do a risk assessment of a, of a certain athlete and then go into with target testing on these athletes. Um, 
Another point that I think is essential for the future is the improved use of the data that we're actually collecting. We have a lot of test data, but um, we do relatively little with it. We rely on the expert evidence, but we can also use some, some artificial intelligence to do that, some data mining technologies, apply pattern, uh, apply pattern identification algorithm, cross-checking with whereabouts, cross-checking with maybe social media information and all these things and then lead to some automated reflex testing on the athletes if some, some mm -hmm. abnormal patterns uh, will apply. We already had uh, at the last WADA uh, meeting some, some uh, informal, uh, meet, uh, some informal uh, consultation with people who have previously worked with, with the FBI, with the CIA who do that on a regular basis with social network stuff. So they have some, some, some uh, experience in, in cross-linking all these uh, data information. So, um, in summary, um, I think for the biological passport, um, I've told you that it's a, a tool for the longitudinal monitoring of, of biomarkers for the indirect detection of doping. Statistical modeling is used, which takes the athlete as its own reference and then compares new values to the previous ones. The sensitivity, depending on the doping technique, is somewhere between zero and about 70%. It has a considerable deterrent effect. And the future will probably be different modules and an improved data analysis in with the passport data. Thank you very much. We don't have time for the question, but uh, Olaf has um, clearly uh, shown the, uh, the application of the biological passport. We still have some difficulties in the detection of microdoses. We still have some difficulties in the detection of autologous blood transfusion. The passport so far has been the only way to um, convict an athlete uh, of a transfusion, not homologous blood transfusion. So it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Yanis Pizzilatis from the University of Brighton, who is going to introduce us to maybe new ways to detect the <coughs> dog with uh, new parameters which can be applied by the biological world. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone and um, I should once again thank the organizers for inviting me to a very exciting two days. Um, I very much enjoyed Olaf's talk and I think he beautifully uh, set the scene for what I'm going to say. If I may use this opportunity just to say one thing that I disagreed with him right at the end there was the importance of genetics and maybe I'll hopefully convince you of the fact that molecular markers is the way forward to try and improve a good system. I'm not going to show any data from metabolomics, but since Olive did mention that metabolomics is not showing much promise at the moment, but I'm not going to show you metabolomics data today. So um, I'm just back from Brazil, having spent a, a few days there, and since that the World Cup is also on the go, I thought I'll introduce with some um, uh, issues regarding football, since it's in the media as well currently. Um, and as we know, um, doping controls are being carried out during the World Cup um, and just prior to the start every single athlete participating was actually tested and bloods uh, urine sent to Lausanne for analysis so clearly um, doping controls are being conducted to a very high uh, number in the sense all of the athletes are being tested um, and just last week we were presenting um, a publication uh, that came out a few months ago in the BJSM on the new approaches to the biological passport and that is really what I'm going to focus on my talk today and that's uh, uh, Jude Vorak from FIFA Medical Commission um, at the conference. Um, so the question therefore is well what are the incidents can we look at the incidents from uh, the testing that has been done and I'll actually come forward so I can see myself um, and this was uh, in one of the papers published in the series and if you look at the uh, positive uh, cases um, of since 2005 right through 2012 it's sitting at about 0.3 percent or 0.35 whatever yet uh, the number of testing has certainly increased dramatically so one view is that you know the incidence of doping here um, is very low 0.33 at least in football are you convinced of that? 
Well, it's difficult to get real data on what the situation is. And um, those of you who are into football would have watched the game yesterday where Belgium beat the USA in 2-1, 2 uh, score. Um, and there was an interesting uh, media uh, study that was done uh, last year in Belgium. And uh, what they did is they asked players in the Premier on their, on their top division if they um, knew... Well, here are the questions they were asked. A, I have witnessed players using doping, but I've never tried it myself. I know that banned substances are being used in the top flight. I don't think doping is being used in the top flight. And what is a little bit worrying is that 24 players chose option B, 4 players um, option A. And that comes to about, you know, 25% or so, you know. So clearly, what is correct? Is it 0.3 or is it the 25% or so? Um, and this comes back to a, a point that uh, Olaf also mentioned. and. Uh, and uh, I think a, a nice quote from David Homan, the Director General of WADA, is that we are catching the dopey dopers but not the sophisticated ones. Um, he's referring to 2010 here, despite more than 250,000 tests being carried out, uh, only 36 came back as positive for EPO. And example, and uh, Olaf is right, we can't give a talk like this and not mentioning um, uh, Lance Armstrong, and that's, and, uh, and that's a, an example. And I think from the point of view of conducting scientific research into developing new uh, approaches, the fact that he, had, he passed all these 500 tests or so was probably the best thing they could have happened for my laboratory because that means that we need to uh, develop new tests. Um, and um, you know all this. I, w I won't bore you with the details of what happened and I'm sure there's more to follow. Oliver's done an excellent job in describing the different approaches to EPO testing and in the, in the in fourth time then I won't actually go over all this because Olaf has done a better job already. Um, and um, just to illustrate the example of an athlete A on the left hand side and an athlete B here, the athlete on the A apparently is not doping and this athlete on the, on the, on, uh, on the right hand side is apparently doping. Uh, and you can see the, 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 the points that uh, Olaf also mentioned. But Olaf also uh, pointed us to the right to an interesting study, the one by Michael Leshenden, which which did not flag any of the athletes taking microdoses, and that is a real concern, because if if athletes are able to get the benefit of the drug, we saw the the data that Olaf presented with regards to the increase in total hemoglobin mass, so there will be or will possibly be a performance enhancing effect, but they're not being flagged up. And this tells me that this, this test is not satisfactory. And I think you'd all agree with me on that, uh, at least based on the study. In addition, uh, in addition to the, the, the flaws of the study, and Olaf has correctly mentioned that the flaw of the study in particular was they didn't carry on after um, the EPO phase. So our hypothesis going back to 2006 when we actually conceived the idea was to actually try an integrative omics approach to see if we can actually improve the specificity and the sensitivity of the athlete biological passport because as Olaf mentioned its premise is actually um, uh, I think a very good one. Uh, he mentioned how there is a requirement for better markers and I think that is really what I'm going to try and address today. And the approach that we were uh, considering and for those of you not really interested in doping but interested in, in performance enhancement legally and looking at the training response Almost everything I'm going to say today is relevant in the sense that I would like to see uh, us using an omics approach to really prepare the athlete for legal performances. But that's a different topic, but I'm going to use um, our EPO to illustrate the power of omics um, as an approach to, to understanding the individual athlete's response um, to a situation, as I'll present today with, with regards to a drug, but also the normal training response and so on. And in the approach that we are wanting to use from the same experiments, uh, the idea is to use all the omics cascade. So th at the level of genomics, so DNA, what can happen. At the tr transcriptome level, RNA levels, what appears to happen. At the proteome level, also at the metabolome level. And what is really key, having very good phenotype and an excellent bioinformatics. Currently, there are weaknesses in all of those different areas, but in the experiments that we are currently doing, we are applying all of this approach to the same experiment. And to actually go through all the omics, I'd need a few hours, and I don't have that. So I'm only going to focus for today on the one that's most powerful, 
um, but we are currently doing all of the different omics. And um, I briefly already mentioned that the metabolome, having looked at serum, plasma, and urine, is really not showing anything too exciting. <coughs> but um, uh, that's a topic for maybe afterwards. But I'll focus on, for today's presentation, on the transcriptome level, which is the most exciting one. So as I already mentioned to you, we, we, had, we wanted to start this. So we had the idea in 2006. Uh, we got rejected twice in 2006 and 2007 because the, the budget or the submission was over $1 million each time, which at the time was almost a, a third of the budget of WIDA. Um, but eventually in 2008, together with um, a good friend and colleague, Günther Gmeiner from Austria, we were funded for the first study, and we've, been re we've received over a, a million and a half dollars over the last few years to do this work, and I'll let you assess if we've wasted the money or used it wisely. Um, so our research hypothesis was the following. To measure blood parameters and gene expression profiles in sea level altitude adapted trained athletes after EPO administration, um, so both altitude and sea level, uh, you saw in, in Olaf's talk how altitude is clearly one of the confounders. Determine the effects of ethnicity on hematological parameters, because ethnicity is another key issue. Uh, with regards to the expression profiles. And this is the key, to formulate revised methods with improved discriminatory power relative to the standard hemoglobin and hematocrit and other related uh, hematological parameters. That is really the aim of what we've been trying to do since 2008. Where to do a project like this? Well, I have a long, uh, long interest in, under in working with the East Africans. So this, uh, this is a uh, shelter topography mission uh, slide. So the color coding reflects topographical height. So the white areas are areas of altitude that we are interested in, in particular the East African region here. And this also happens to be the, the area where a lot of the, the top uh, distance runners live and train, not only from Kenya but from other countries They come in and train in this area. Uh, and the area of interest is, is the Nandi region of, of Kenya. Uh, that's where we, we did the altitude work and we compared the responses to sea level athletes in, uh, uh, in Glasgow. I um, already mentioned this is where a lot of the foreign athletes also uh, live and train. Okay, our study design. So we had a Scottish group, so uh, 19 endurance trained males <coughs> living and training uh, at sea level in Glasgow, and 20 Kenyan endurance athletes living and training at 2,150 meters. I'm going to be very clear and say that while uh, they were doing the study and for a, a period, uh, a prolonged period of time after the EPO phase, these athletes were not allowed to compete for obvious reasons. Um, so it was a 10-week design, uh, a two-week baseline, uh, uh, four weeks of uh, EPO and then four weeks uh, uh, of not taking the drug. Um, you can see the measurements and the time points at which we've done that. The key is down here. The point to make about the EPO injections, these were the kind of EPO dose that, were, that allegedly were being taken in the 90s. So about 50 international units per kilogram, so quite big doses in comparison to the micro doses, but uh, somewhat a <coughs> subclinical dose still, but the, the kind of doses that, that uh, clearly were having a performance effect, and I'll show you some of that shortly. Um, we, in Kenya, we're not a, a, a wider accredited lab, but we, we try to follow the procedures uh, uh, precisely uh, using the same type of analyzers. Here we have the Sysmex XT2000, and here we have the PhD student at the time, Dr. Basho Haile, collecting a, a, a blood sample. Um, some of the data has been published, and I'll share with you some of this data. So here we see the time period of here in weeks. The gray area is the EPO phase. The, the, the circles here are Scotland, the open squares here are Kenya, and this is hematocrit. And you can see, as you would expect, this difference at baseline because of the altitude. Um, and you can see here after four weeks of EPO, it is interesting that the, the, the rise in uh, EPO of, of, sorry, of hematocrit is not paralleled in the sense that you find that here the Scottish athletes, the, the, there's a greater increase reaching to roughly the same point. Um, we did have a cutoff of, of uh, 55 as a cutoff for uh, stopping injections, but I think only one volunteer achieved that. Um, you see that the, the, the drop afterwards is uh, more rapid in the Scottish athletes uh, than in the Kenyan athletes for four weeks. As you would expect, hemoglobin uh, mirrors that quite closely, so I won't dwell on that. It's very, very similar. We also <coughs> conducted performance testing, VO2max, not a performance test, but VO2max gives an indication of how the drug could be working. Uh, our lab in Glasgow and our lab in, in Kenya. Um, and these are the results. Uh, you can see this is baseline in Scotland, it increases. 
uh, and then it comes back down at the end of the study, but not back down to baseline. So you're still having some effect even uh, uh, after four weeks. And there's the same pattern in, uh, at altitude, uh, higher VO2 max, better athletes uh, we found in Kenya. Uh, but the pattern is very much the same, and as those of us interested in altitude uh, and, the, and, and the effects of EPO, it's interesting that uh, despite the, the, the less of an increase in, uh, from the point of view of delta in hematoglobin, hemoglobin, the performance benefits seem to be the same. Uh, and that is also seen here as a kind of uh, a change in VO2 max. Uh, here in Kenya, on average, it's kind of a, some uh, variation, but 6% and 9% here. Uh, and not coming back down to baseline by the end. And it was important to actually present the performance there to you because you may have read this ridiculous paper. Uh, sorry if I say that. Uh, I hope no one was also in the list, uh, in the room. Because they were saying that the effects of EPO have not really been demonstrated. Well, I think that's clearly not the case. Uh, EPO does work. Uh, and don't believe anyone is saying anything the opposite. Um, well, you want some more evidence though, rather than VO2 max. This is a 3,000 meter time trial that they conducted. And you can see there's the improvement uh, in Scotland, the improvement in Kenya, and it still doesn't come back uh, uh, to a baseline. So you're still getting a benefit uh, four weeks later. And here you see the change in performance at about 5% uh, here um, uh, in the Kenyans <coughs> and, and about 6%, roughly the same. Uh, and that's what we have at the end of the study. Still a 3% benefit here um, uh, in, in performance. And so we reject this claim that EPO doesn't work. Um, but the main issue you want to see is what happens to the omics measurement. So I'm not going to go through all our different uh, approaches because what we do is we, um, we collect urine, saliva, blood, and we, op and we create a biobank that we can use for the development of future tests so we can go back to this biobank. So if any of you are interested in this kind of work, I recommend you do the same kind of thing. Collect as, as many different samples as you can from, um, uh, so we can actually uh, allow possibilities of future development as one of the omics works, another omics doesn't work, and then maybe uh, one of the omics is not working on its own, but if you integrate with another of the omics, it starts getting additional power. So this is what a recommendation I would make in addition to collecting uh, depending on what approach you want to use, looking at microRNA, but I won't have time to talk about our microRNA work at all, but we also prepared for that. Um, so I've already shown you the design, but I want to show you the design again, this time showing you the time points where we actually, uh, because of the costs involved in doing omics, we were a little bit selective in the time points, at least in the beginning when we wanted to see, does, is this going to work? Because this technology, as you can imagine, costs a lot of money. So we took a sample, we analyzed, sorry, the sample, the first baseline, the second baseline, after the first injection, after two weeks of injections, after four weeks of injections, then post one week, post two weeks, and at the end. So those are the time frames I'm going to show you the, the omics results. So um, just try and remember that, but I'll, I'll try and remind you too. So uh, we're starting off with uh, the Scottish group. Um, we presented data from um, 18, only because the 19th the individual was, was quite ill during the study, so, so we're not including his data here. So 5% false discovery rate uh, was the, the level we use of significance, together with a, a one and a half fold change in greater, and this is during the EPO phase. And there's different criteria and thresholds you can use. This is actually, I mean, the threshold here is not of importance from WADA's point of view, because in a court of law, you, you need to really have very, very stringent um, uh, criteria. But uh, this certainly allowed us to identify, with a fairly conservative uh, threshold, um, any molecular markers. So after the first injection, okay, so this is the first injection, 41 genes are achieving that threshold. So and they have 41 genes are being upregulated. And we can call these ones the, the kind of sensitive genes. Um, after two weeks of injections now, we have 811 genes that have been differentially expressed. 736 up, 75 down. Again, those of you interested in training or whatever your area of interest is, imag imagine doing this kind of approach to understanding normal training. It's very, very powerful, as you can see. Uh, after four weeks of EPO now, there's uh, uh, 394. Uh, 390 going up, 4 going down. Um, and this is what happened in, um, uh, in Glasgow. If I, on the Venn diagram, if I put the numbers, you can see there's the 40 we started off. They still maintain throughout, as you would expect. And you can see the numbers here. But you want to know, well, what happens in Kenya? Well, in Kenya, roughly the same. I remind you that the change wasn't as, as, as big. 
Uh, but we find roughly the same 60 here in common. Um, and then of those 60 and 41, 32 were in common. So in other words, roughly the same, I would argue. The first genes that you'd want to look at if you're developing a diagnostic tool are those 32. Um, uh, and that's the, during the EPO phase. But the, the, the informed person will say, yes, this is great, but with, with urinary EPO levels, I can, we can detect EPO anyway. That's one argument. So you really want to know what happens post-EPO. All right, so this is now exactly the same format, but this is now post-EPO. Um, uh, and you can see here that after one week uh, of not taking an EPO, there's 11 that are downregulated. After two weeks, there's, there's, there's a... 249, 7 up, uh, 242 down, uh, and here uh, you can see the still 139 down regulated, um, and that's in Scotland. If we look at uh, 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 in Kenya, roughly the same pattern. If you look at the overlap between the two, uh, you can see there's about five in common. And I think the key point here to note is that after four weeks now of not having EPO, so four weeks later after the last injection, there are still 31 genes that are being differentially expressed. And I'm using quite a conservative cutoff. If we change this to 1.4, these numbers increase quite a lot. If you change it to 1.3, they increase even more, and so on. Um, but you really want to know, that's fine as groups. What about the individual response? And again, those of you in the training response, look at this data. So this is, uh, again, over, over the weeks, uh, this is a log ratio relative to the average baseline. In, in green, we have the Scottish athletes, and in, and in red, the Kenyan athletes. And look at um, uh, the, the change. Um, and this is a log, a log uh, ratio. So you can see that uh, I mean, everyone is going up, and everyone is going down, and it's been downregulated subsequent. And you see the pattern is, and this is just one of the genes. Uh, and if I'd gone through all the, the 32 or so genes, the ones that achieved the, the first level of, of uh, threshold that we used, you'd see roughly the same pattern. And we've already been introduced to the biological passport. We consider that as normal fluctuation, that abnormal fluctuation. Uh, and um, you can see uh, how this would work from the point of view of having a, an omics biological passport. So the idea, therefore, of an integrative omics approach or solution would be not to throw away something that a lot of us in the room were quite happy with. You saw that m most people who responded to Olive's questioning said this is uh, a good way forward, the biological passport. So don't throw this out. It clearly has its use. But let's add other markers. And this is what Olive was saying. And here we're talking about gene markers. What about uh, other of the omics as we develop robust biomarkers? Um, and and um, I think this is the way forward. Um, there was some, a lot of media attention uh, to this kind of work, and this was in the New York Times a few months ago. Um, the secret of a bulletproof anti-doping test, how long would it take to actually come up with a test? I'm, I'm often asked this question. Well, we've been funded more recently to look at uh, a key component, which is um, uh, looking at a microdose. You want me to read this, but the whole question is what happens, because this is, uh, giving, been giving um, uh, quite big doses, and athletes are, are taking microdoses, as we've, as we've heard. So we've just completed the study only a few weeks ago. Uh, another weakness, I should say, of our previous studies, that we, it wasn't double blind. We didn't have a placebo. Um, so what we've just finished now, this only finished a few weeks ago, is we had 14 subjects split into two here, EPO, placebo, then switched over, um, and taking a micro and using a microdosing uh, pr uh, protocol as per Ascendant, so the previous study we mentioned, um, uh, and importantly, we have the post phase as well. I'm afraid I can't show you any data because I said we just finished a few days ago, but the idea is that to apply the same molecular markers to um, the microdosing and see what we find. I'm pretty optimistic that it, it will work, but I don't have data to show you today. At the same time, and you won't better read this, we've been f you know, uh, funded for another study to look at other confounders. I remember presenting something similar, um, and Carsten Lumbu, I think is someone in the audience, mentioned, well, yes, what about other confounders like being in an aeroplane? What happens about going diving? What about gender effects? These are all males we used. Uh, importantly, what, about, what effects of altitude? And I think Olaf mentioned the importance of exercise. So these are all the confounders that we are looking at. Uh, here's an example of um, the uh, repeated 
uh, Wingate tests that we're doing before and after um, uh, the microdosing project in addition to uh, 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 VO2 max and we're collecting samples um, at different stages during the, the, the intermittent test as well to see are any of those genes possible confounders. Uh, I don't think it will be the case but we need to do that um, and that's just an example of us doing the, the experiment. Finally, the, one of the big confounders I think is altitude, five minutes, yeah, great, um, is altitude um, and we wanted to get a clue as to whether this will work because you can imagine that altitude is likely to switch on at least some of the same genes and that's going to be a possible problem. And we collaborated with uh, Rob Roach in this first study. Uh, he published uh, a nice study in PLOS One in 2014 where they went to Bolivia. The study was called the Altitude Omics Study. Um, and they, uh, and here, those of you who know Rob Roach can see him here um, orchestrating events in Bolivia. He, d he looked at 21 subjects, 12 males and 9 females. Um, they traveled from USA to Bolivia and stayed over 16 days at 5,260 meters. The nice thing about the study was that this was at higher altitudes than athletes train. And, it, and you're almost getting the extreme to see well, what genes are being switched on, what other omics markers are being switched on, are they overlapping with the EPO ones to try and differentiate the two as confounders and being able to go as high as possible like at 5,200 gives us I, I believe a, a, a real ability to, to detect um, if these are going to be confounders or not. Um, there is a problem in their study, they used a different platform to do their gene expression. I didn't mention we used Illumina because it was cheaper. He used the better array which is the AFI chip so there is a different platform but they tend to agree. Uh, we used, uh, in, our, in the study I just mentioned, we used whole blood expression. He used from um, um, RNA from uh, PMMCs. Um, so there are some differences so, but nevertheless uh, what did we find? So these are the EPO genes uh, using this threshold as you can see here um, and you can see the number of genes that are, being, that are uh, achieving that threshold. For altitude which is now um, Rob's study you can see that while nine are overlapping they are considerable which are different and that gives us hope that this is promising and, 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 and could work. Um, however, there are problems. I mentioned different subjects, different time points, different altitudes, different issues, tissue samples, different platform as well. So we've just finished another study um, where we've taken uh, 20 elite endurance trained uh, athletes. They've uh, same time points as the EPO. They've just come back from uh, Sierra Nevada in Spain, um, and we looked at uh, gene expression from whole blood so using the same exact pro uh, protocol. This is what we've done. So baseline went to Sierra Nevada, came down, we collected samples uh, up until four weeks and those samples also currently being analyzed to see uh, and I don't have data on that at the moment to share with you but that this is the what needs to be done to come up with, this, with uh, a definitive will this work or not work and this is the group of athletes that went up to Sierra Nevada. So what I've hoped I've shown you is that uh, we've, we've been able to show you the the first molecular signature of EPO, um, these results provide the strongest evidence to date that omics technologies such as gene expression have the potential to add a new dimension to the ABP. And these very encouraging results serve to strongly reinforce the feasibility and the need for this complex, expensive and technically demanding approach uh, with leading industry partners to develop the next generation of tests. And while I'm using the word expensive, and when I say that normally uh, WADA or, or, sporting governing, or sporting governing bodies say, well, this is going to be very expensive to do, it's expensive to generate the test. So when you look at whole genome, that's expensive. But when you actually go down to the 35 uh, genes of interest, it actually is much, much cheaper than the current test. So this is not going to be a problem. It's expensive to, to produce the, the, uh, the test, but uh, hopefully it'll be, it'll be cheap to actually run. Um, and... Uh, we believe this kind of approach will also will, will hopefully also um, enhance the situation with other drugs that have been used and Olaf mentioned the uh, growth hormone for example and we think that is a, a way forward because the, the current approach of growth hormone has got its problems and, I, uh, and the same applies to other drugs that, are, that have been that were allegedly used by uh, Lance Armstrong like testosterone, uh, cortisol um, and so on. Uh, if I have gone quite quickly and you want to read up more about the, the future of what we think is going to be important in this edition that just came out, we, we summarize a lot of what I wanted to say today. The final thing that I would like to mention in the one minute that I probably have left is that 
collecting samples, nu numerous samples of a, of a, over a whole season, you can see how difficult that is, not from the type point of view of costs, but actually uh, having to get the athletes to do this. Um, and if there were any lawyers in the room, you could also argue it's against human rights to be requesting people every day of their lives to tell us where they're at. One thing I didn't mention here is that by looking at the housekeeping genes, if you were to look at those genes that are not changing and to look at a ratio of the, of the genes that are being switched on and off in um, comparison to your, your uh, housekeeping genes, we are also hoping that we could develop a one-off test rather than a situation of having to take repeated samples. That is different to the uh, biological passport, um, but I think that also gives us hope that, you know, that a test like this, you can tell the athlete if they want to cheat, they can, they can do it. If they want to know when they're going to be tested, we can tell them, but if it's as sensitive and, and specific as we think it's going to be, then they will be caught if they do it. And that may get, get away from the whereabouts. It is quite an ambitious statement I'm making, but I, we are working towards and hopefully that could be something we can achieve. Who knows? Um, Finally, I'm just a spokesperson of this work. There's a, I have a fantastic group of students, postdoc collaborators, advisors for that, that, uh, that's, and some of you are in the audience. Um, incredible support from WADA and I really thank them for that. Um, but two of the main workers that have really driven the work is PhDs, uh, Jerome Dressel and Dr. Bashu Haile. One did the work in Glasgow, the other one did it in Ethiopia and both students got ACSM student awards at last year's ACSM, a reflection of the, of the hard and great work that they did and I thank them for that. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Because the next session on anti-doping is here, I think we have time now for one or two questions. If you want to, Yanis, or to order. Who's winning the race? Or you? We will, no doubt. Okay, why? Because with the passport, we got ability to see what they're doing before we before we know um, exactly what it is. <laughs> exactly. You know, so we see tendencies in the passport that we know are not normal. We don't know what they're causing, but we're on it. So I think what's in the press is not true. Okay. Other questions? <coughs> Um, prior to the, the passport, there was a 50 percent hematocrit cutoff level. Um, I'm just wondering if that was a fair test. Did it disadvantage certain riders, um, and was it a license to dope for others? There's a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Uh, you've seen from the distribution curve, every biological variable is usually normally distributed, and if you are on the right-hand side of the distribution with your normal baseline variable, then obviously you have no margin to do, whether when you're on the left side, you know, you have a big margin to, to do. But I think at the time, I think given the, the, the scientific knowledge that, uh, that was available at that time, that was the best that, that could be done in order to prevent bigger damage. So I think it was declared as well as a health test and not as an anti-doping test at the time. <coughs> But, but my comment on that is that I, th I think it was also unfair because certain <coughs> populations uh, would be excluded from the start. And I remember a, a funny example, or a serious example, is a cross-country skier from Ethiopia who was the first athlete who wanted to compete in the Olympics and couldn't. Um, you know, because you do find individuals I at altitude from these, um, these populations who have hematocrits of greater than 60, and that's not doping, it's normal. I think that there was a problem with that athlete. There I mean, was a problem with that athlete. Because <laughs> there were allowances which were made for athletes with a high natural amount. I just have one more question because people are coming in, so we are going to start the next session. Yanis, you showed great results using EPO. Yeah. Because we know that athletes use different substances together, do you think that this might have an impact in the discriminative hour of your test? Um, it's an excellent question and you're absolutely correct. Um, if, if the different cocktails, if I can use the term loosely, cocktails are being used and it is switching on, um, uh, affecting the same genes in opposite directions, we have a problem. But it's probably unlikely that to be happening. So I, I think it's probably going to allow us, as Olaf mentioned, to identify possibly what they are taking in addition to EPO or whatever. And the final point to make about that as well is that there, there are some studies, or is a study, 
It's not published, but it was done in Australia looking at um, transfusions using an omics approach. Um, uh, and I've, I've, that, that report was made available to WADA. And if you look at the transfusions, different genes are being switched on to the ones here. Some overlap again. So that also gives us promise that if you, you can differentiate between EPO, transfusions, altitude, etc., etc., there'll be a different set. So you can almost think of a, a chip that could be your EPO gene, your EPO chip, your, your transfusion chip, your, those of us who've seen altitude, an altitude response chip, you know, etc., etc. And already Rob Roach is developing, a, it's not commercially available yet, but a chip that he can tell with 98% confidence with who's going to get altitude sickness from using exactly the same powerful technology. So that gives me hope.